This episode is sponsored by TicketBud. Has your event ticketing provider dropped the ball this past year? Have you lost access to personal customer support and account management? You need a ticketing partner you can rely on. TicketBud has always maintained personal customer support for all its clients at no extra cost. It's all part of the service, along with early payouts and access to all features. TicketBud also makes it easy to transfer event information from another provider. Get a 20% discount for all your 2021 events by visiting TicketBud.com slash GatherGeeks. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here's your host, BizBash chairman and founder, David Adler. Today we're bringing you live sessions from the first BizBash conference in the post-COVID era. We all gathered in Las Vegas recently and had some wonderful conversations and presentations, and we're really excited to share these with you. So take a listen. We're thrilled to have you here in Vegas uh, with our partners Connect, and we have over a thousand people on our virtual audience. So we're looking at you in our camera. Hope you can see us. You're going to hear from some of those powerful people who are going to share ideas, inspiration, and intriguing insights because we need to know this stuff now more than ever because we're rusty. We're trying to get back in the game. No one knows what is going to happen. But I'm thrilled to introduce today our first panel, the new culinary experience. So joining us today is going to be Joe Coza of JVC Catering, Thomas Whelan of Levy Event Restaurants, Zeke Brofman from Cross Beverage Company, Kasha Prang of Red Rock, where we're staying right here, which is a fantastic place. And joining us virtually, my friend Carla Rubin from Creative Edge Parties. So why don't we do that? I want to go through a little bit with each one of the panelists to tell a little about what they do so that you can understand uh, the perspective for our conversations that's coming up. We're going to actually be broadcasting this we're, uh, live right now. We're also going to have a, a Gather Geeks podcast on it as well. So this is a place where you're going to hear multiple stories and we'll be able to distribute it in different ways. So Joe, you've been my guru in events and catering for the last 20 years. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Thank you, Dave. What you've done, too. Uh, thank you for all the amazing things you do for our industry. It's really exciting to be here at this beautiful hotel and up to present. I am the principal of JVC Catering and Consulting, a company I started in January after a 45 year career in catering and events with Sheridan Hotels, Hyatt Hotels, Fairmont Hotels, Marriott Hotels, and I was also the vice president of sales and marketing for Cipriani. So I truly love the industry for my entire career and I'm so excited about getting back together and, and doing events again. And if anyone doesn't realize the buying power of the event industry, that we are really the trendsetters and the people that know what's going on. Joe, how much business, as the head of the New York area Marriott's, your buying power is incredible. Probably one of the biggest buyers of food and beverage in the world. Oh yeah, so definitely. Uh, you're talking probably a couple of hundred million dollars in sales that generates a tremendous amount of buying. And I said, um, that's a lot of ketchup. Yeah, that's a lot of ketchup. <laughs> yeah, ketchup. absolutely. <laughs> Mustard, ketchup, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But every little thing you think about is also yep. part of that. And, yep. and we touch so many places. Thomas, you actually have a pretty nice buying power yourself. Yeah. Every like, time you think of something, it could be in the plates of thousands of people around the world. Yeah, Joe is playing in the ketchup and mustard. I'll keep the relish over here. <laughs> but yeah, I'm with Levy Restaurants and specifically the Levy Convention Centers. We're all throughout the world. If you've been to London, we're there. If you've been to Greater Columbus, we're there. And we operate the food and beverage for all the convention centers as well as sports and entertainment, cultural attractions. So we're everywhere and we're here to help make your experiences even better. And your buying power is incredible too. Yes, I mean, we, we, have drive, a <laughs> we drive a lot of the business in, in this country. Yes, we're doing you know events every day from 30 to 30,000 plus. And then when you look at our stadiums, 65, 70,000. And to think we might have 100 to 200 of those events in one single day throughout operating under Levy, it's... So you know. you're just getting over your exhaustion. Yeah. I mean, nice. the COVID has been great <laughs> for taking a break. <laughs> so Getting those miles back soon. That's right. Our miles are interesting. Kasha McElprang, we're here at your, your place. Yes. Tell us what you guys do. This is one of these Las Vegas traditions. You've been open for many years. Tell us what you do 
Wonderful. What your day to day well, life is. Thank like. you all for being here virtually and in person. We're super, super excited to have um, our building full of like minded professionals. That's what it's all about. What a better group of people or couldn't be a better group of people to um, open our doors to. We have been open since June 4th of 2020. So we have had a lot of events, small, medium, large, but this is the one that is closest and dearest to my heart. I'm 25 years in the catering and events industry, and it's a blessing and a pleasure to have a virtual and a physical audience to talk to you about getting our event industry back to its new norm and welcome everyone. And Zeke Profit may not be able to brag about how many years he's been in the business, <laughs> but why don't you talk about <laughs> Sesh and, and what you're doing in terms of creating a completely new type of beverage company. Definitely. Thank you so much, David, for including me. I'm happy to be here. And as everyone has said, it's just so exciting to be getting back to life as we know it a little bit. My name is Zeke Bronfman, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cross Beverage Company. And we are focused on better for you brands that are in that emerging fourth category of beverage alcohol. So that's sort of anything in the FMB, RTD, or Spike Seltzer space separate from wine. Wait, spirits or can you um, translate that? <laughs> Anything that's separate, so wine, beer, and spirits are the three traditional categories in beverage alcohol, and now there's a whole growing trend of ready-to-drink cocktails, flavored malt beverages, spiked seltzers, anything that you're seeing in cans pretty much these days that's taking up more and more share of the total beverage alcohol market every single year, and that's really where our brands are focused. And you're still in college. I am not currently in college, but I, I should be, I guess. Okay, <laughs> you're one of those <laughs> highly uh, motivated people that will go back. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Carla, where the hell are you and what are you doing? <laughs> Great question, David. I'm so happy to see you. I wish I was there with you. I'm actually in St. Thomas finishing up a five-day event. I think I've averaged about four hours of sleep. And as you said before, my muscle is a little bit weak being at parties right now because we all have been waiting for this day to come back and the business is coming back for sure. And you have a large crowd there, I hear? Yeah, all five people. Yeah. <laughs> wow. This industry is incredible. We love it because you, you can have a conversation with any one of these people and find, about, find out about something new that you never even would have heard of before. And before we go into sort of what's going on today, Joe and I were honored like maybe 10 years ago? Yeah. And yeah, at, at, some, at an industry event. Yes. And Joe, in his speech, decided to give us the menu for what it was like in 1980. So yep. I want you to go through the past and, okay. and bring us up to the future. Well, thank you. I'll be the historian and talk a little bit about what happened and where we were back then. My first slide is not going. Okay. Oh, here it is. It yeah, is. it's here it is. There it is. Okay. So. I was opening the Grand Hyatt in 1980 in New York City, and at the time I decided to collect the menus from all the top hotel competitors in the market. This page has something in common. All of these items is just a, are just a sampling of the actual menu items that were being sold in catering events, again, at top hotels in New York. Chilled VH juice was actually a lunch appetizer. Moose of soul, Yankee pot roast, ham steaks, Salisbury steaks, fricassee of turkey. How about snowballs of ice cream and savarin of fruit? Notice coffee, Sanka, and tea. We didn't brew decaffeinated coffee back then. We had something called Sanka, which was a lovely little packet that you put into hot water, for those of you not familiar with it. Wait, so Kasha, do not get any ideas about VH. <laughs> it's great food cost. So let's take a look at what was happening with pricing back in 1980. So these are actual prices from menus at that time. $6.50 for a continental breakfast. I don't think you can get a latte for that in today's world. $16.50 for a chicken lunch. How about a chicken dinner for $25? $11 for a bottle of, not a glass, and of course $2.50 for a domestic beer. So obviously we've come a long way with not just the items that we were serving, certainly with pricing, when we've come a long way from the quote back then that used to be another rubber chicken dinner. Catering has really expanded. So I wonder what Instagram or Pinterest would have looked like in 1980 <laughs> for people taking photos uh, at events. So I did a little research and found some photos of party food from the 1980s. Wow, how about a lovely cheese display? Chefs liked to do a lot of things in skewers back then, 
and this is a really creative presentation. The other is a stuffed lettuce. I'm not exactly you sure. Know, that could be a new trend. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 Don't I, tell no, Thomas about that. I have no idea what that's stuffed with, but um, again, very creative back then. Chefs were always looking to mold items and manipulate food in those days. And this is a lovely presentation of a seafood mousse in the shape of a fish. What really stands out is that lovely base of lettuce. We went through hundreds of pounds of lettuce as, a, as just a useless garnish. And I love the three cherry tomatoes that really make this dish <laughs> pop. Yeah, this is gonna be a award winner. Uh, <laughs> How about for breakfast, bananas with ham and hollandaise? I have no idea how that goes together, but that was a menu item. And then something, again, a pate of some sort with some sort of green covering, not exactly sure. And I believe the other presentation is a mint jelly mm. with a lamb salad is my best guess. Joe, I see a whole Instagram <laughs> old food uh, <laughs> site that you yeah. can set up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and aspic was all the rage back then. Chefs used a lot of aspic. Here's a lovely combination of aspic with frankfurters, eggs, and green peas. Looks really yummy. And of course, the volavant. Actually, that's still around in certain menus. Actually, fine dining was quite good back in those days, but catering was always much more simple and not as, it was always a second thought. But the Volavon, obviously we weren't thinking much about healthy, seasonal, organic, et cetera, et cetera. Or the presentation. Yeah, or the presentation, <laughs> exactly. What about uh, the cost of food? Is it airline style cost of food? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a lot of bulk food. That'll show on some of the buffet shots, but here's some more stuffed food, this time a bread uh, stuffed with cheese and crackers. Lots of bowls for desserts on buffets particularly, and ice cream bombs were both on buffets and served table side. All different types of flavors and combinations. Boy, chafing dishes were a huge hit. Here's a unrecognizable array of foods, one next to another. We didn't label anything back then, so it was really eat at your own risk. Not much presentation value in this either. And the last slide is, I like to call this just an abundance of food platters <laughs> in no particular order or purpose. Uh, I love the elevation in the middle. We actually remember doing that with stacking up tables and putting linen on it and a lovely centerpiece. Again, notice the lettuce base on almost all of the food. So the message is we've come a long way. I certainly have seen incredible progress in the catering and culinary and events during my career. And I'm really excited to, to think about where we're going and, and all the new ideas and creativity. It's in a phenomenally great time to be in the event industry. Great, that is that is an eye opener and it's a cautionary tale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we don't want to go back there on the reunion. No, 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 we're not Thomas, going back. where are you I taking us? Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to revisit a conversation about a stuffed lettuce. I don't know. <laughs> you know we can create. Make it cabbage. You can turn stuffed call lettuce me in into March. the coolest thing. It's a whole new world. Yeah. Oh. If my chef is watching, I'm sorry for the call you're going to get. So yeah, when we, were, when we were talking about the past and obviously the future and expectations in the future, and one of the big things that whenever I talk to people about conventions is, they think of that dreaded attendee meal experience, that brown bag, that brown box. And what I really love some of the things that we're doing in our convention centers is letting our chefs use their arts, their culinary arts, and creating really cool things. So I, I wanted to show a couple things. One is really bringing into, that is not your traditional convention center lunch, I'm going to tell you right now. Imagine this for 13,000 people coming in, they're grabbing a bento box. This is obviously a reusable bento box, but we're also doing compostable item. So this is uh, palm leaves. And this particular one was for 13,000 people at one time received this to go. And then when we're thinking about that was a plated experience in Boston, but you can go to Columbus and meet their team there and they'll serve it to you on a conveyor belt to go through your, your trade show experience. So you can just grab your meal and go. We're also seeing really cool things. Rustic might not be your thing, but this draft line is non-alcoholic items. We're seeing a lot of people talk about zero proof items and drinks and how we're doing that. I just love this. This is also in Columbus, the team out there, our manager there, Molly Dale and their experience director, Hillary are just incredibly innovative people. That's really what we like to do. Bring, if you need to do a, a salad in a compostable, grab and go. What are we doing? How about this? You're not, again, this is something that 
people are expecting, and we're, I know we're going to talk about that later, is elevating. We're doing uh, pho, pho for people. You grab your pho offering, and then you right behind you is a broth station. Choose your own broth. You can add your sriracha. Again, these are my phone photos because I just thought they were really cool in the moment. We're doing clay pot buffet experiences where every item is individual, kept warm, and held for you. This, again, was a, a meeting that we did for about 25, 30 people. You're able to just take things, it's elevated. Or how about a tatar in an individual sphere? You can eat it on the go. These individual experiences where people, along the lines of meeting where you're at, the food has to be there as well. Some people are not comfortable going to attend it. And I know Kasha is really going to dive into that because she's been doing the work for us. Again, non alcoholic station that it was in Columbus as well, where you could mist your flavor, choose your bottles. I really love this. Finally, was really working with the experience. This was for a chemistry convention and we serve them their desserts in petri dishes and their non-alcoholic drinks came in beakers and steamed this was an apple cranberry spritzer of sorts and it's just really cool and that's what we're looking at for the future is elevating those experiences surprising and delighting on what they know and bring it to that next level at any price point at any price point i mean that's what yeah yeah some people some of these some of these items were surprise and delight items that we brought in to just enhance an event and really talking to your culinarians who are again culinary arts our chefs are artists they want to flex that that paintbrush and really do some fun stuff get us all in a room get us a whiteboard and for the right dollar we can create you the right experience is there one surprise moment in a, in a meal or is there a how do you pace it in a sense in, in my opinion, it's you're going for two things. I always want it to look and taste great. And then when you go up to see how it's presented, have that be a part of the enhancement. Utilizing at least four, to, four out of the five senses at all time. I think that's the whole element right now. People, after being at home, and they've explored one side of their menu that they order from all the time, what we're seeing is people are on the other side of the menu. They want new, they want different, and they want what they're used to, but better. And we all stumbled onto YouTube during the last 15 months and found Bon Appetit and all the different cooking shows. Now we're all at home chefs and they want the meals that they can make, but better. And now they know how to make it. So we have to even amplify it. Yeah. But, what, but the thing is that when you do a plan, do you do one or two like really fabulous moments or do you have to make every single thing? I, I think you start with the one and it, it's like going upstairs. You start with the one, you start with the two, you go to the two and you keep adding because you don't want to do something to make it ex exceptional and it fails. Right. You can't the focus. Risk is, the, it's the very ri risky. The risk and the reward has to be there. So yeah. when you're doing very large scale events, 30,000 people, if you want to have that surprise and awe moment, you got to nail one. If it's one a day, sometimes over the five days with 60,000 people, it could be just once where you're just like, blown away yep. and then the next event try to get to that second but you have to take it in baby steps at that level and in my I think we've all done it and at one point you'll start the rinse and repeat of the wow moments because that's what's great about conventions we get some people once a year we can do a new element right. and it's always a constant surprise for them but you're starting from scratch right now because yes. it's a new world you're not repeating rinse and repeating from no. old days no there's no more rinse and repeating no. there's hand washing thank <laughs> you for everyone yeah there's hand washing <laughs> and sanitation <laughs> yeah there's we we are if we got a new dishwasher in our industry i think like we're not rinsing and repeating we have brand new plates brand new machines Everything. brand new staff yeah that's what they did Kasha, tell us what you're doing. You've been experimenting now since last June. Yeah, so we so tell us. It's it's been amazing and it's been amazing to be on this panel. I think we're all at different stages of coming back into our our old world. Red Rock and Las Vegas reopened June 4th of last year of 2020. So we're nearly a full year into having done events, which has been amazing for us and trying at the same time. Um, doing events for 50 people at a max and then back to 250 and then back to 100 and now the the blessing of having 525 industry professionals here today. Very similar to what Thomas is doing. I will be honest, I think a lot of this is driven by corporate culture. Corporations are going to tell us what is comfortable for them. If they're comfortable getting their attendees together in a hotel, that's fantastic. Everyone has a different level of comfort. Some of them work very closely together and they, they have a lot of meetings. Sometimes this is a first time back. So having individually presented food is absolutely key and it has been for the past year. But the key and what we talked about previous is food still has to be beautiful. We definitely eat with our eyes first. We eat with all of our senses, but we definitely eat with our eyes and having things that are still really appealing is awesome. This also allows us to have a lot less waste. And I think prior to us going into the COVID um, situation, we were all very focused on not being as wasteful and not having the abundance 
of things that would ultimately end up going into shelters or whatever. The sustainability is built into the it, system It absolutely now. is yeah. built Not in. like it's yeah. something that, oh, yeah. we're doing sustainability. The, glut the <laughs> gluttony is gone. Everything is truly portioned individually. But you can still have incredible food. These also are from my iPhone, so I apologize. They're not the professional pictures that I would love for you to see, but you definitely get the gist that little bite-sized food options can still be incredibly beautiful. Those two options are both vegan, and that's also still a very big trend. So if there's questions out there in the world, being vegan and having all of our dietary restrictions covered is absolutely still very much a part of what we're doing on a daily basis. It's no longer one or two like really bad vegan choices <laughs> no. in the back room. <laughs> I think I will tell you a true story. So we do crab cakes really well. We have a beautiful steakhouse, one of the best in Las Vegas. We also do a vegan crab, crab cake out of jackfruit. I swear every single person prefers the jackfruit crab cake. Every single time, there's never been an event where that wasn't the case. What an amazing trend and a change that is happening with us. We're just being more sustainable in our choices and liking things in a different way. And I think it goes back to what you say. People are okay getting out of their comfort zone, but at the same time, people still love mac and cheese and they do want those home cooked meals. I think that pot roast may have a place back in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. Take it up has to look a little prettier. Absolutely. But this jackfruit is a big deal. It's I've a heard very big this deal. Over and over again about jackfruit. Yep. I, all, and you yeah. can do it in all kinds of ways. Yeah. This is a tricky picture to see, but we did and we are still doing, you'll see an experience if you're here live in person, and um, we are doing cafeteria style service, creating the barrier between the food and um, the guest so there's only a single person which is a chef handling all of utensils. I do believe putting it out there for the world I believe in some of the more um, progressive cities and states this will be going away. Las Vegas Nevada for instance is allowing open buffets now so we are allowing self-service again with some regulations in place but I think this again will be one of those things where we have to really take the lead from our companies and our partners. If they feel comfortable having self-service that's what we'll offer. If the company needs to have something to to feel safer and have the cafeteria style service. And the buffet to normalize it though. What's gonna be different about so what's normal? What Nevada is regulating, which could be different in Florida and Texas and the other states that are super open is we have to change out utensils every hour. Mm -hmm. um, we also have to have hand sanitizer available. To me, that doesn't feel like, I still feel very COVID freaked out about that, but I think that's what they're saying is going to be safe. And I, I think we're all going to see regulations that are either county, state, federally regulated, and we're all gonna get back to either this new norm or a different norm as we right. continue to go past the, the pandemic. Great. Yeah, just some beautiful selections here and some things to come for you all that are in our building. This will be some things to look forward to for the next three days. Fantastic. Zeke, why can Seltzer's and why did you have to leave school in order to create this incredible business? Yeah, so the origin story was I grew up drinking a lot of full flavored spirits with my grandfathers. And when I got to college and was given the option of pretty much value beer, that didn't really work for me. And my co-founder is a type one diabetic and he was an athlete in school. And any of the drinks I were having were way too high in sugar, too high in calories, too high in carbs for him, or didn't have any information on their labels because the FDA and TTV hardly ever require that. So there's no transparency in the space. And so he couldn't have any of the things I liked. And so we wanted to create something that had that full, authentic, robust flavor profile I needed, but came in that better for you, all natural, zero sugar format that he and so many consumers nowadays are demanding. And then this, though, the cans uh, are okay now. Remember in the old days, cans were like, oh my God, what are you guys? <laughs> Hotels had to do glass bottles for, yeah. I so mean, decades. Yeah. <laughs> Your timing is perfect. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny, when we were starting this two years ago or so, we would go and meet with hotels and restaurants and clubs and bars, and we were laughed out of almost every single room we went into because for that exact reason, they told us no one is ever going to drink through a can in our event. And what we've seen is that now every single one of those places carries cans, if not exclusively, as a primary focus of their business. And we're now doing things like putting a sesh vending machine inside of one of the most high-end accounts in all of New York. And so I think it's been a crazy shift and that's definitely has to do with the pandemic. It's about portability, it's about convenience, it's about less touch points. Um, and a coolness, a cool brand too. Yeah. Is good. You're also doing concerts coming up. What tell us about that? Yeah, we're going to be having a really cool concert at, that we're participating in. It's going on without us. We are just really yeah. lucky to be able to have our cans there at MetLife Stadium August 5th. So we're going to be doing a lot of point of sale merchandising signage, which is really exciting for sure. That's great. That's great, Carla. Yes. Tell us about what Creative Edge has been doing and how you have changed over the year. And then I'm going to go back to you to, for the first big question of what is 
the future in your opinion, especially from the catering point of view on all fronts? So I think that it's been very interesting to watch the catering industry come back. So right now we're in this very heavy duty wedding world and it's a very different feeling for us because every single weekend is weddings and now we're slowly starting to see the corporate corporations come back. I think for the past year, many companies really looked into sort of the virtual and I feel like that is now going into the background and for sure live events are coming back. We're actually seeing a lot of corporate events coming back this summer and they're trying to get their people back together and have the groups come together. We just were approached by a corporation for a 1000 person party in New York City. We're doing another 600 person party in our Florida office. And so the corporations are slowly getting comfortable. I think that they're feeling the need to bring people back together. Obviously, everybody's hearing that the offices are opening again. So we're feeling very positive. We, from a standpoint of catering, we are still very much in individual portions. And we've done a lot of design and redesign of our trays. Our food stations are also all individual because the point of contact people still want just quick and easy. And we're not using the glass borders. We're doing more interactive and- Wait, say that again. The the glass. Yeah. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of going to the guests and delivering individual portions to them. And that's making people very comfortable. So it's a very different feel. I also think food has, it's taking sort of two different directions. It's going back to the past. And at the same time, people want real experiences now and people want way more excitement because everybody's been sitting at home. So they're way more thematic and there's a lot more interaction and there's a lot more entertainment. And so we're really working with that sort of vibe right now. When you say go to the past, you're not going back as far as Joe went though. (laughs) Uh, we're, we're almost there. We're are almost you, there. Are you, VA juice is cool? You can make You're it right, cool. Exactly. I know. I, <laughs> the Sanko was just, it was a great one. The Sanko was fabulous. But no, people are really wanting food to be part of the experience and food to be part of the entertainment more than ever. We had seen that before, but now it's everything because everybody's been bored for a year. So I think that as we had hoped, it's coming back. Everybody keeps talking about the roaring 20s, I think we're absolutely going to be there. What is your crowd pleaser dish that it's like everybody wants? And I'm going to ask this of everybody. Is there like, is it the comfort food piece? Is it the exotic piece? Is it the, it's comfort food. It's comfort and it's clean. It's ceviche and a pigs in a blanket. It's sort of (laughs) those two. And there's a lot of consideration for vegan. Are you guys, what are you guys seeing in terms of what people want in terms of like your hits? like that you would go back, even though you don't want to rinse and repeat, we know that, but there's Social a certain- wants the, the Instagram, like weddings yeah. want those Instagram moments, especially with the cocktail hour. They really, they like the smoke, the steam, the vessels that are really cute and little, everyone likes tiny things. It, it goes well into Instagram. I think our corporate events are still liking that very familiar, very comfortable. All of the dietary accommodations met without a lot of hassle. I think we're seeing a double-edged approach. Yes. And there's a lot, I and think there's you're a seeing lot. the protein on plates. I know the, the vegan, when you talk about movements versus trends, I think a lot of the movements in our food and culinary experiences were started pre-pandemic, but now it's just taken on even a, a, a bigger role in everything that we do. And I think protein on a plate has also diminished in size and the vegetarian, the, the vegetables and the grains have become so much more important. And it's authentic, it's real, recognizable, but again, with vessels and things that we that chefs and, and culinary um, experts can do, you can make very simple food look very spectacular. Are you all um, looking at events? You're, you're talking about the culinary side, but the culinary side is just a piece of it. Most of you are now in event design in a much bigger way because of that. Do you want to comment, Carla, on, on yeah. what how yeah. you think about serving? It's interesting because so many times I feel like in one way we're the event designer, 
but it's all around food because food can become the design of the event. So we put a lot into that. We have a 10,000 square foot design studio with loose site and woodcutter and, and metal welder. And we are constantly taking the marketing message of a company and helping develop that in the guest experience. So sometimes we start with the design and then we decide what the food's going to be. It doesn't, it's not always food first. It can just be what's the experience going to be. Like we did an event uh, recently where it was a disco night and we actually got small record players. And when you opened it up, it was moving and the disc was actually a, a cracker and the whole meal was served on that. So it's really playing with, and you didn't need anything else on the table. So it's really playing with design and food and experience and those three have to work um, all together and very evenly. Are you seeing that? All you guys are seeing that too, the, the combination that you're not really food people. Yeah, for, in, for corporate events in particular, in my opinion, our first conversation is always the logistics. Like I'm, as much as I feel like a food and beverage pers person every day, I also feel like a logistics and operations person trying to figure out where 12,000 people entering one room to get one meal at the same time and they have 30 minutes and we've all experienced what that conversation is and we're looking at how do how can we include ourselves in the overall plan with distribution space lining things up creating cues i will say for people in our world i the great thing not the great thing but one of the positives of this past year is people are going to understand why lines and cues and paying attention and listening are very important. So I'm really, maybe I've just convinced myself that I'm not gonna have those resistance conversations. <laughs> Carla might disagree. I'm thinking like, how can we work? That has to be more inclusive. And especially to touch on what you were saying with corporate is on its way. They realize the necessity for events. We all know the necessity for in-person events, but the liability plus also considerations of their corporate social responsibility. I love that people are asking for convention centers. What do you have that's unique? If you go to Javits in New York, they have a they have their honey. They make their own honey from their bee farm. We have a community garden in Boston. So that's something that a lot of corporate and also our relationships with minority vendors, our relationships with local vendors, those are bigger conversations, almost logistics and inclusion that are happening in the menu planning, which I love. But it's all part of the um, mix. You've yeah, got to bring that up yes. uh, as what you're doing. And uh, Carla and I always joke about the one thing everyone says, I want to do something that no one else has thought of. <laughs> How many of us have heard of that? Well, yeah, I, I also think a big part of it is offering variety, particularly if you're, you're talking about corporate events. You take something as simple as a coffee break. There was a time where we just had milk just one kind of milk. And the consumer now is sophisticated. They'll go to a coffee shop and there'll be milk and almond milk and 2% milk. And, and, and you have to supply all that. And, all and, of it. and the expectation is there in their personal lives. And if they go to an event and it's just one type of coffee and one type of milk and maybe two different types of sweetener, you're not satisfying the, the sophistication of the attendee. I, mean, I do have know. another point. I think that I really appreciate and love having been in event world through this is in the queuing and all of the things that are happening to be safe and through compliant processes, people are allowing more time for people to mix and mingle. Conferences used to be down to a 10 to 15 minute um, break every morning, afternoon. Lunches at some points were 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And in order to be compliant with COVID regulations, all of these time frames have expanded. Our conferences missed that. I think attendees are overwhelmed every day in their life. Too much they're, content. There's too, there's much, too much and there's too many That's interesting time schedules. for all of those virtual. Yeah, workers. and I think this, it, we're allowing people to actually come to a conference and do what they come for, which is to talk yes, to one another. And we're creating yeah. those organic experiences by changing the time frames and I think that's gonna stick I really feel like that's gonna be a let's get trend. Zeke's perspective on on college kids today are that you're hearing what we're saying are you saying are we in touch with what's going on in what these people are saying or are we so far off no absolutely first <laughs> let me preface it by saying I'm probably the least least <laughs> hip 21 year old you'll find so yeah. with that caveat being said I think that what we're seeing is, I remember a year ago, year and a half ago, and this was all breaking out, there were all these conversations and hypotheses about how the world would fundamentally change. Would we ever shake hands again? Would we ever go to a conference like this again? And I think what we've seen now, year, year and a half into this, is that those things that are so fundamental to human nature are never going to change. And 
if this is the only evidence we need, here it is. But I think that what is changing and what's accelerating are changes and trends that were already in progress before the pandemic hit. And those are things like health and wellness. And that's been in motion for years. People have been trending towards organic, lower sugar products. But now that they understand what a massive impact this has on their lives and how relevant it can be to them, it's becoming more and more common. People are looking at labels way more than they did before, and that's accelerated that trend by five or 10 years. I think the same thing with convenience and portability and reducing touch points. So that applies across the different things, and I don't think that's de different on different age groups. I think that people are more comfortable in our age group adapting to this change and moving forward with this progress, but I think that with the new times, older generations are becoming used to it and figuring it out as well. I think social media has changed everything too because Absolutely. we're able to peek over the fence to see what other people are doing. You used to not be able to get into someone else's event, but the whole purpose of BizBash was to peek over the fence and see what people <laughs> were doing. And so I think that we're all learning, we're all becoming one homogenous age yeah. in many cases. Uh, let's move a little bit to the bar. Since we have uh, Zeke here who is, he can now drink and he's producing an alcohol -like <laughs> product. What is going on at the bar? Carla, do you want to talk about it first? What do you see at, what are you serving like this weekend at your big event? I do, Zeke is absolutely spot on. We actually have been doing the cafe at the Van Gogh exhibition in Miami. We're about to open another cafe at the Van Gogh exhibition in New York. And exactly what Zeke's doing is actually our number one seller. So it's been very interesting, the canned drinks, the individuality, the cleanliness, that's been a big thing. And I think we'll be bringing that uh, concept into catering because it's always been a challenge to get specialty drinks to a thousand people within right. you know five minutes of entering. So I think that there's some play there. I also think the individualized drinks being packaged and personalized is a big deal also. So everybody wants everything personalized, not just weddings, but corporations. And also with this sort of everybody coming back, it's more important than ever that company logos and brands are, are being promoted. So we're doing a lot of that in the drinks, either in the ice cubes or with a dusting on top or individually packaged, especially cocktails with clients' names on them. Really? How about the quality? Uh, Joe, why don't you? Well, I, I also go back to the point I made before about variety and offering different choices. I, obviously, the ready-to-drink uh, cocktails are, are all the rage now and coming in. But in addition to that, I think the days of having one red and one white wine <laughs> are gone. I think you need a, a variety of reds, a variety of whites. Not everyone drinks Cabernet and Chardonnay, although they're wonderful. You, you need a Sauvignon Blanc, you might need a Pinot Noir, same thing with beers, and same thing with spirits. Offering a variety of single malt scotch and a blended scotch, Again, it's all about that sophistication of the guest and the client who, who is living that every day and in, in a bar or in a restaurant that they go to. And then the expectation is that catering needs to follow through. Are we upping the game in wine and brands? Are, we, oh. are people asking and willing to pay? A absolutely. Yes. Yes. I believe so that. That's quality. Yes. Yeah. Your grandfather would be happy. <laughs> quality, quality is a huge, I think, elevating that entire hospitality experience and quality is going to be critically important. You can't serve a bad wine or else no. you're going to get no. killed. No. Right? No. You if can. you want to sell it, you need to serve something nice. Right. Carla. Right. Yeah, it's actually more about tequilas right now. And wines have taken a little bit of a back seat to the tequila world or the vodka gin world. So mm -hmm. brand names and brand mm -hmm. recognition are huge. They've gotten, they've yep, come yep. back. All spirits are, the variety again is so critically Champagne important. still big? Uh, but yeah, uh, Prosecco, yeah. champagne. Yeah, I get more requests for Prosecco right now, yeah. I think, than actual champagne. From a cost perspective for large scale events, it's great, much better. Great uh, beverage, yep. But yeah, and who doesn't love a good sparkling? And also, we saw the push, or I felt the push of sparkling rosés being yeah, a standard. Sparkling rosé. Yeah. Rosé all day, it's been. To also comment on what Zeke was saying, like I was opening a ballpark last week in Massachusetts. He's and we dropping had... names of Lenny's. No, and we <laughs> could not keep seltzers in that fourth really. category, seltzers are wild. And the expectation is not only that you have seltzers on site, you also have a bunch of flavors. What the flavors people want is, which I just, th this fourth category, including bottled spirits and pre-made cocktails being in really cute bottles and presentable and sponsorship opportunities, like people want that. And also, I don't know if that's from COVID and wanting everything individualized and personalized, or if people are just like, you know what, I like this is mine and I know that I open it and that this has always been mine. And I think on top of that, it 
adds a lot to the fact that you know exactly it's a consistent drink with mm -hmm. the same amount of alcohol. You don't, it's yeah. not a mystery every time. You don't know, oh, am I gonna suddenly wake up really drunk tomorrow morning? <laughs> and it's also yeah. for safety concerns. People are worried about what could be slipped into my drink. And now yeah. with the canned beverage, that's pretty much and eliminated. speed the service. So we've all been um, queued up at a bar waiting for a cocktail that's probably not being made very yeah. well. So the consistency and speed so, of service is critical. So this is another point for all of us, lines. Oh. Do we, how much do we hate lines and have you solved that problem? Yes. Yes. Uh, Carla. Yes, it's all communication to the client. I love when a client says 500 people are coming and I want to make sure there's no lines. And I can <laughs> literally say to them, then give me 500 bartenders, there'll be no lines. I mean, it's, all, it's all math. It's completely math. And if you figure out how much it takes to serve each person per drink and do the math, if they want to wait 25 minutes, that's their choice. But it's really, it's a matter of, of making sure that when people get in, that there's drinks that they can readily take off the tray right. and take the pressure off the yeah. bar or there's no, there's yeah. no hope. So as part of the new, we're really talking about the new culinary experience. That's yep. what it is. I want to go a little bit onto aesthetic. We had a conversation in our pre-meeting on the aesthetic of what people want. I was telling them I was the, probably the oldest person at the Teen Vogue Summit. And, <laughs> and I noticed that they didn't care as much about the decor like we do in terms of the fancy backgrounds and things like that. It was a little less, less in your face. Zeke, what is your sense of what the aesthetic is from your I mean, friends? It's gathering yeah. is more important than the- For sure. The so what I've definitely been seeing is people are trending towards minimalism, simplicity. They don't want to be hit in the face with things. And especially when there's corporate branding involved, if it's too over the top, too branded, it, people run. They're way too smart these days. They understand that something is inauthentic and not genuine, and that completely throws them off. So I think toning it down, really simple, smart integrations with brand is how we're thinking about doing things. And that seems to connect with our audience. But I understand that bigger brands who haven't done things in the last year and a half are probably really excited to throw massive events and spend a lot of money on all these little details. And your advice to them? May work for them, I have no <laughs> idea. I don't think it's how you authentically connect with a younger audience and that sort of new community who they're really trying to connect with. The new culinary experience. Yeah. I think, I, think, I think you have to look, I'm sorry, I think you have to look at the type of event. I think social events and weddings, I, I think that becomes far more important and has become important to do things beautifully and add decor. And Carla, do you agree with that? I think it depends. I think it depends. I think it's all isolated. For example, there's a big Bitcoin conference going on in Miami in a couple of weeks. And because there's so many companies doing parties, they actually want to make sure that people know which brand they're at. I agree with Zeke. I always tend towards be smart in how you use any kind of design or marketing and don't hit people over the head because they're going to appreciate it. It's going to, it's going to sink in deeper. Other comment, Thomas? I was going to say, just looking out from here, I think this is the future out here. Like, it is clean. It is, and for anyone who's watching at home, you can't see it, but hopefully they'll do a pan of it. It's clean, it's comfortable, and it's considerate. I think that's what people are really um, responding to is authentic and considerate. That they feel like you have considered their funness, wellness, enjoyable experience in everything that we have, we're taking care of them. Attendees want to be coddled a little, I think. Right. And I think that's what I'm seeing from both a corporate and a social, but I think as Kasha and I have been talking earlier, like social still nuts, like they want, yeah, Social still <laughs> wants to create their own event, and it, we talk about it over and over again. They want things to be unique. They want variety and selection. Is that because they don't do the same, they don't do a wedding every... I, I, like, I think weddings have just been insane, and Carla, it's just so refreshing to hear that you're the opposite side of the country, and it, it feels like it felt in 2001 when we came back to work after September. It just... People are just ready to do things that feel really good and wholesome, and they want to make an amazing experience. And our industry is so blessed to get to be a part of these yep. great once-in-a-lifetime events and momentous occasions um, for everyone. And it's not just weddings. We're doing celebrations of life in numbers like that I've never seen before. We very rarely used to do them. And now it's like every family wants to have a celebration of life. And I love that our industry is getting recognized as supporting all of these different things that happen throughout our lifetime. Yep. What I want to do in the last few minutes is go around and, and put your crystal ball hat on. And this is the time where we can actually dream. What is the dream that you want for this new level? We can create it. We may not, it may not be uh, stuffed uh, lettuce, but Joe, you can start. 
what our dreams. What do you think is going to happen? Com final comments of the new well, culinary agenda. I, I, I think more now than ever, people, I know I'm tired of cooking. I'd like to go out more for dinner. I'd like to go to more events. I think many people are. We've all become chefs at home over the last year plus. But I, I think there is such a pent up demand and people want to travel. They want to experience things. But it's going to need to be quality, it's going to need to be engaging, it's going to need to be meaningful, it's going to need to be authentic. But I really think we're heading into even more creativity, but again, done with thoughtfulness and respect to all the attendees in the future. I really think that's a big part of what we're going to do. Thomas? Authentic, considerate, and bold flavors. Bold flavors. We talked about bold, bold flavors. flavors. Well, quickly, tell us the bold flavors that you think I, are hot. Look at Trader Joe's and see what they're buying. Like, I, I not to name drop, but like, people want that Arjika, the citrusy salt. They want flavors of the world. You're going to see saffron, zatar, cumin, just all of the flavors okay. that were behind you in the, the, the hook, spice. So I want to go bring through it back. Every... I think I can't wait for our industry to continue to bring people back to work and for our ladies and gentlemen to take care of all of our guests. I'm so, super excited to see the volumes return and our team members returning yep. to work. Zeke? And I just think that out of every single crisis, there's such cool innovation, and I'm so excited to see what comes out of this and, and what comes next. We can't wait to see where you are in the next 10 years, exactly. Carla, to not the last in my heart anyway, of course, you're always the first. Um, what's going on? <laughs> in my crystal ball, yeah. I'm just gonna tell you is the word catering is gonna disappear, and the chefs and the food that we produce is gonna become uh, world renowned and taken on a way more serious level because I think what we do is so tremendous and the concept of the celebrity chef, we need to scoot around them and really show the world what we're doing food wise. That is a great way to end. I want to thank everybody for coming. We're going to be right back. Kate Pate of Pate Consulting will be right back and uh, we are happy that you were able to participate in our first session in the new world. Right. So thank you yeah. so much. Thank you, Dave. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.